All right, without further ado, my name is Chris Griffin, and I am the president and co-owner of La Rocca Inspections. Um, La Rocca is a family of four inspection companies. La Rocca itself is a general physical inspection company, real estate inspections. Then we have a mold inspection company called Moisture and Mold Check Professionals. Mold is what we're going to be talking about today. I have a sewer line inspection company, sewer line check professionals, and a chimney inspection company, chimney check professionals. Uh, today we are going to talk about mold and how, you know, the whole thing that you deal with during your real estate transaction. Because obviously mold uh, can be a scary thing when you don't know about it. When you do know about it and you're educated about it, it's actually a really simple little preacher. So moisture may lead to mold growth. Uh, moisture itself is the basically the, the number one ingredient that you need to have mold. If you don't have moisture, you don't have mold. Not anything that's alive and doing any damage to anything. <clears throat> Experts agree. So in other words, we did a study on the accredited bodies who basically say, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, says mold grows when there's moisture, period. The key to mold control is moisture control, the Environmental Protection Agency. And since mold requires water to grow, it is important to prevent excessive moisture in buildings. That's OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Hazards Administration. What is mold? Mold is a fungus. Bacteria is a little bit different. How is it different? I'm sorry? How, how is that different? Well, bacteria is a bit a, a different chemical mock-up, if you will. Okay. Just, yeah. Okay. Bacteria is not necessarily a mold. Mold survives by sending out spores. Okay, so myotoxins, mycotoxins from the, from the mold actually go out into the air and kill off other molds so that it can survive. Bacteria doesn't necessarily do that. Bacteria can kind of stay dormant. Okay? That's one of the significant differences. So mold is a fungus which reproduces by sending out spores. Spores are these tiny, microscopic little things that go out into the air. Now how does mold travel through a household or a building? You hear the air conditioner, right? So spores can get sort of sucked up into the return air, run through the air conditioning, and come right out to the supplier. So you could have a mold issue over here, and because the air conditioner is on, we literally could spread the mold issue somewhere else where it then lands and there's moisture and food. So it sometimes can be just that easy to spread mold. Mold is nature's recycler. This is the neat thing about mold, is that it's everywhere. It's everywhere. So that's where we kind of start, especially in a real estate transaction, because many people who don't know about it are so freaked out about it. And the first thing we're going to tell them is, you've got mold, don't worry about it. It's natural, it has to be here. We wouldn't have many things that are actually helpful if we didn't have mold. And a song, cheese, you know, these things, they're made from mold. So mold basically helps to break down those things in the environment. Right? It, 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 you walk through a forest and you see the dead trees laying on the ground and the white mold it just eats it and decays it away. So it recycles. But mold can create health issues. Now, this is what most people are concerned about, especially someone who's buying or, or uh, getting into a real estate, a real estate transaction and they're wondering if their house has mold or their building has mold. Because maybe their grandmother, maybe their young daughter, their baby or something may have a disorder or their immune system is lessened, right? So a mold may affect them health-wise. Now one mold may affect you and it may not affect you. So different people can be affected by different molds. And that is an interesting thing about the mold, is there's not one particular mold that will definitely affect you all in the same way. Okay, there is a mold, a toxic mold called Stachybotrys, that likely we would, we would all feel the effects of if we were in close proximity to Stachybotrys. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But that's the, that's the issue with mold, is that it can affect people differently. So it's very important, obviously, to find out your client's concern about mold. And then obviously, please follow their instructions. So how does mold grow? Now remember, there's at least one ingredient we already talked about, right? What was it? Moisture. Moisture. Remember the picture of the strawberries in nature's recycling? Strawberries 
have moisture in them. So the mold is feeding off of the strawberry. Now it's interesting that this mold is white. Typically mold will start to take on color of whatever it's feeding on. What color is the inside of that strawberry? White. Yes. Mold actually penetrates whatever it's eating and sort of eats it from the inside out. So then it starts growing and showing the color of whatever it's eating. So it can take on the color of its food source. So how does mold grow? Low light, food source, and moisture. It needs those three ingredients to grow, remain alive, and continue to procreate. If you take away moisture, you have no mold. If you take away its food, the mold goes dormant, it dies. If you take away, if, uh, if you put it in direct sunlight, again, it'll go dormant. But it will still be there. Moisture is what is needed for it to continue to, uh, continue to grow or to become. So what I mean by that is, let's say we had a mold issue. Let's say we had a roof leak and the water leaked down inside the wall. And the weather was there long enough, 24 to 48 hours is when mold would start to grow. So then we started seeing mold on the wall. Now we take care of the roof leak and we dry the area, but we don't remove the mold. The mold's still there. It's just dead. But if I were to spray it down with a water bottle, it starts growing again. So when you reintroduce the moisture, even on dead mold, it's going to start to create again. So when you do have a mold issue, by the way, in giving this example, approximately, does anybody care to take a guess how many mold spores, remember the microscopic little things, how many mold spores fit on the head of a pen? A million. You fit on the class before you cheated. Yeah. Approximately one million, that's correct. Now, different, different types of molds, it can be lesser or greater, mm -hmm. but approximately one million. So, has anybody ever seen mold on a wall or a lot of grapefruit or on a banana? You can see it, right? So, if you can see it, one million of those things fit on the head of a pen. How many spores do you think you have? Potentially billions. A whole lot. A whole, whole lot. So you have these three things. Now, low light conditions obviously can occur in an attic. It's a very, very common place or underneath the house. Or inside heaven. Because it's usually close. Sink leaks, cabinets made of wood. We got food, we got moisture, low light, common place to find it. Here's uh, underneath the sink. So normally, again, the cabinet's closed. Obviously, the light that you see here is the flash of the camera, but you can see all the ball spores on the wall. You can see the moisture right here. So this is from a, a drain line leak underneath the sink. Now, the mold is not necessarily growing right where the moisture is. That's fine, it's just making the area damp. It's making the area humid, you know, because of the temperatures. So mold's gonna grow where it has its most, uh, most food source, if you will. Now you may be asking, well, this is a painted mold. How is, how is that food for mold? How can I have mold on paint? I would challenge any one of you to go to a home center and grab a can of paint and read its ingredients. You'll likely find things in that can of paint that are natural. Natural ingredients. Rubber. Mold can grow on rubber. Why? How's that possible? Rubber, real rubber, comes from a tree. So you see that you see sometimes you'll see the mold in the in like the bathtub and the shower wall, and you get that little bit of mold, household mold there. How is that possible that it's growing on the on the grout or on the, uh, the you know the ceiling, the dap? Because there are ingredients in that dap or in that grout or in that paint that are natural and the mold's feeding. Out of all of your home inspections that you have done, have you or your client crawled under that? No. Into the attic? No. It's not your job. It's not even part of your attic, your agent visual inspection disclosure. You're not supposed to or don't have to go to those areas. So it's left to the actual inspectors. If there weren't inspections, this would not be known about. Because I can guarantee you, there's a document. It's called the Bi uh, Statewide Buyer Sellers Advisory. And it's written by CAR. CAR, again, is your California Association of Realtors. These are documents that basically tell you as realtors what your rules are, what you should follow, what you should have your client do, what your role is, what your ad is. 
That document talks about mold, specifically what your client, a buyer in this case, let's say, needs to do when they are concerned about mold. That document says that they shall have the seller disclose anything they know about mold or past moisture related issues. Then if buyer still has concern, the buyer shall have the property tested for mold. Most sellers would not know this because most sellers don't crawl underneath the house. A general inspector would inform you they wouldn't say you have mold under the house. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't want a general inspector who said you have mold. Okay, because the general inspector, while they may have seen thousands of inspections and have been told by mold inspectors that that is mold, sometimes it's not mold. Sometimes it is just a fungus that grows on wood that the termite guy typically takes care of with his chemicals, his or her chemicals. So it's oftentimes hard to determine what is mold. I have had uh, inspectors call out a mold-like substance on a wall that they think it's mold. Mold inspectors got in there, samples it, tests it, and it's dirt. So it can look a little different. It doesn't necessarily have to look, you know, fungusy. Your, mold, your physical inspector would typically say there appears to be some sort of growth. It may be a mold-like substance, NLS, um, that is in this area and should be further evaluated by a specialist. Here we have a, a ceiling. This is made out of jute. This is made out of paper. So that's a food source. So we had a roof leak here. You can even see the damage on the wall over here where it's bubbling out, um, and now we have the mold. Now, if we have mold on the outside and the, and the leak came from above the ceiling, what do you think is happening if you remove that tunnel? Mold is already eating through its food source and now starting to show on the outside. So it could be pretty considerable on the other side. There's another source of food. We sort of talked about this a little bit earlier. So here we have a window, and this is a metal framed window. And this is a metal frame that's been painted, okay? But again, dust and dander, pet dander, it just settles here. And then if there's moisture, the mold will grow on that. And typically, this is something that you would keep clean and find the source of the moisture. In this case, it was one of these seals from the window that had rotted because of the sunlight. And when the moisture source was, was, uh, was ready and the mold was clean, it was done. This is common when a house floods. Very common. What they'll do is they'll pull back the damaged floor, right? And they'll replace the floorboards or pull back the carpet and replace the carpet. But oftentimes they don't pull off the baseboard. Moisture gets, you know, it's like a sponge. It seeps up behind that baseboard. And then, of course, when the baseboard is pulled off, you can see that we have mold contamination. So remediation, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Remediation is best left to the experts. Moisture, number one issue. Where does moisture come from? Everywhere. Right? We'll talk about some sources of that in a little bit. But here we go. Here we have a, a, a stain on the ceiling. Who knows what their AVID is? AVID, AVID, AVID. Okay. AVID means Agent Visual Inspection Disclosure. As you guys become agents and you start working with clients, you're going to have a document, again, by CAR, California Association of Realtors, called an AVID. And that the document charges you, the agent, and the buyer, and the listing agent, to walk through the property and do a diligent visual examination of those areas that are open to view. You do not have to pull couches away from walls, or, as we said earlier, crawl under the house. But when you're walking by this, you most certainly would say, stain on the ceiling. Okay? Now, this is not that class, but of course, in my minimizing risk class, I would go into, that's all you would say. You wouldn't say the roof must be leaking. You, know, you just basically state what you see. But the purpose of this picture in this class is to show you this is very common. We find stains, okay? But we don't know what's behind the stain. So, of course, the only way to determine is there mold and does any remediation need to be performed would be what we would call destructive or intrusive testing. And of course, that would be left up to your client. Your client would say, yes, I need this area examined. Of course, you and your client would get permission from the seller to make a small hole, do an in-wall sample or something like that, so that we could bring them the information of what needs to be done in this area to not only correct the source of moisture, but to remediate, get rid of any potential hole, and then, of course, to build that so it's all painted and nice again. So a stain on a ceiling 
If this was caused by last year's champagne you know, during New Year's, then there's nothing to worry about, really. But if there's a continued source of moisture, such as a roof leak, the problem should be a little more sinister. Black mold, who's heard of it? No such thing. Black mold is a media hyped term that uh, basically the, a, a big mold scare occurred late 90s, early 2000s. There was a huge flood in Texas. Um, who remembers Ed McMahon? Right? Lake Show or, or Johnny Carson sidekick. Uh, he had a major mold issue at his house in, in um, Malibu. His wife got very sick, unfortunately, his dog passed away because of it. So obviously, anytime a major you know, player in the entertainment industry or any industry a major player, the media is going to grab a hold of that. And then that's what created, well, that's what created my company. You know, we started this company in the early 2000s because there was a lot of mold inspection companies coming on board. And most of it was about the hype. They were already scared, so the mold inspection was easy. You know, yeah, you didn't even have to, they would just call you, you wouldn't even have to promote. But we got on board because we recognized it was just going a little too crazy. We wanted to put some sanity in it. Yeah. Why was there so much sickness there? Did they not see the mold? Or? The mold that they were dealing with, again. I would say it's dead to the mold. Yeah, it can. Well, I know that. I mean, why did they not see it? Well, the mold that was occurring in that particular case was Stachybotrys. Stachybotrys oftentimes is black in color, but it can be a different color at times. Stachybotrys is a highly toxic mold. So like I said earlier in this presentation, that many molds may affect you and you differently, or me and you differently. Stachybotrys, if you were all to just gather up in a group, walk into a garage that the, the roof has been leaking for the past 15 years, and you see this black <coughs> slime coming down that back, that back wall on the wood, that would likely be Stachybotrys, and you're likely going to feel the same effects. So that it is a toxic mold. And likely what happened was, I don't know in particular if most of it was hidden or if it was there and they knew about it and it just wasn't caught in time. But again, mold spores, they get right out into the air. You breathe in one or two spores, a few spores, and that could potentially get you sick. And again, it's with, it has a, a lot to do with the immune system of the person as well. So black mold was basically a medium high term. It's used now to sort of describe likely stocky botches. But as I said earlier, Mold can be any color. I mean, this little test dish here, all of those molds are stocky bunches. So it can be black, it can be yellow, it can be orange, green. That's why black mold is misleading. Okay. So any mold may cause health problems. Obviously, common household molds, stocky bunches, any of the more severe molds, any of the lesser molds. They can. It depends on your immune system. And that's why, as I mentioned earlier, mold is a personal issue to your client. Let your client make the decision. If they're concerned about mold, then have them follow the instructions in the car document. So here's some moisture sources that can obviously help to cause moisture in the home that can lead to, to, to mold. Obviously, the outdoor moisture sources uh, the homeowners would want to uh, mitigate health control as best as they can. Rain, let's keep the rainwater outside where it belongs and not inside. Flooding, this is, this is a major issue, not necessarily here unless the height breaks, but in many other parts of the country, flooding is a major issue. Anytime a home floods, again, as I said earlier, I would not recommend doing the build back yourself. That, that really does require professional coming in, humidifiers, you know, or dehumidifiers, air scrubbers, the whole bit. Drainage issues. This is a common problem here. Houses without roof gutters. Houses that have the, the, the landscaping around the house sloping towards the house. Not only does it cause foundation issues. Did you know, by the way, moisture, water, is the number one leading cause to structural damage in a building? California. It's the number one problem that home inspectors find. Not only does it cause uh, mold, but it can actually cause the house to sink into the ground, causing foundation issues, sloping floors, you know, doors and windows that don't quite operate very well. So moisture is definitely something you want to you want to address. Landscape and irrigation. All too often we see the sprinklers are facing the house. 
It's easier to install the sprinkler outside the planter bed and then spray in as opposed to install the sprinkler right up against the house and spray it out. But that's more recommended. If the sprinkler is close to the house, but direct them away to the planter bed. Humidity. This is a uh, heavy issue here down by the beach. Um, definitely in Florida. Mo business is a booming business in Florida. And then high water tables. You know what a high water table is? Basically, we have naturally occurring water in our dirt, in our soil, right? We may be able to go out in that field and dig down five feet and dry as a bomb. But maybe by the time we hit 15 feet, if we're installing, like, let's say, building a sub garage, sub parking area, maybe then, of course, the water starts seeping in. So a high water table, sometimes we crawl underneath the house, and sometimes we'll see that it actually has evidence that moisture during the rainy season actually comes up out of the soil under the house. Indoor moisture sources. Cooking. The number one moisture causing day of the year, for those of you who have been in my class before, comes to work. For those of you who work with me, comes to work. <laughs> Um, the number one, anybody care to take a guess, the, 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 the day of the year that introduces the most moisture into a home. There's one day of the year. Exactly. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving Day. A lot of cooking going on, right? How about people? You have family and friends in your house. Maybe you have family staying over. So you might be taking more showers, using the bathroom more often, maybe doing more laundry. Right? In those few days before and after Thanksgiving. That's the number one day of the year where moisture can uh, get introduced into a building. Here's another, another little interesting fun fact for you. Would you think that a building that was built uh, in today's modern standards of building would be more susceptible or less susceptible to mold issues in comparison to a building that was, say, built, let's say, in the 50s? Which one would you think would have the more of a mold issue if moisture got introduced. More. Here's why. <clears throat> in the 70s, we created uh, the energy codes. All right, those energy, energy codes have been ever evolving. If you drive around, and you, you've all probably seen it, you've seen a building being constructed, and you're looking at it, and it's got this white wrap on it with this blue writing that says Tyvek. Have you ever seen that? That's a vapor barrier. It's a moisture barrier. Now, homes was built in the 50s, or even prior to that, or even into the 60s, didn't have that vapor barrier. They had stucco, they had chicken wire, and they had what's called tar paper, which was penetrable and breathable, right? And then they had wood. And the idea was the moisture would pass through the stucco, hit the tar paper, and drop straight down, and come off the bottom with what we call a wheat screen, which is sort of a little metal thing in there that allowed water to come out of the bottom of the wall. But when the energy codes came out, we started wrapping these buildings, making them very energy efficient, but we also made the ability for them to breathe. We took it away. Our buildings right now are in air. We're piping in air. These windows don't even open. In the 50s, 30s, you turned on a fan, you opened your windows, the white curtains were blowing in the breeze. Houses were breathing. Our houses, our buildings, our houses don't breathe anymore. They're wrapped up. So, that's great for keeping the moisture out. But when the moisture gets in from a broken pipe, it can't get out. So now, it's just sitting inside. Yeah. So basically, we have created the need to ensure that moisture is controlled in the house. Outside, in, inside, out. You could put approximately 500 gallons of water, introduce it into a home that was built in 1948. I'm not suggesting you stand there with a garden. I was going to just spray the hardwood floors down with 500 gallons of water. But throughout one year's time, you could introduce through all the different methods, um, a leaky pipe, cooking, showers, bathing, whatever. You could introduce about 500 gallons of water through that house during that year, and it would dissipate naturally and it wouldn't become a mold issue. What do you think today, if you were to introduce in one year's time to a house where it potentially comes and becomes a mold issue? It went from 500 gallons to what? It has five in it. Five. 
five gallons. So that is to say that our energy codes are great, saves energy, but yet there's other issues that must be looked at, addressed, and, and obviously maintained, and known about so that you do maintain them. Interesting, huh? Showering, of course, big source of moisture. Uh-huh, you got it. <laughs> Laundry, okay, both washing your clothes in the washing machine and then, of course, doing the dryer. As you saw the mold picture before, it was actually from a dryer vent underneath the house. Pipe leaks, of course, that's obvious. Window leaks, mold, moisture. Especially the double pane, you've seen the double pane windows, right? You ever seen moisture in between the two panes of glass? That means the, the actual seal is breached. Now, if it's breached on the inside, if it's breached on the outside and you've got moisture, it's still getting down into the frame of the window, so it can potentially come through. But if it's breached on the inside, it most certainly has a direct path to the inside home. AC condensation, air conditioning condensation. All air conditioners put moisture into the air. They actually have a pipe and a pump that takes the condensation moisture away from the structure. In this case, this is leaking. And you can see the actual stain here. And that's from the naturally occurring condensate water in the, in the air conditioner itself. What's the solution? We touched on this a little bit before. Your statewide buyer sales advisory, mold section. Buyer and seller advise that the presence of certain kinds of mold, sometimes referred to as toxic mold, may adversely affect the property and the health of individuals who live on or work at the property, as well as pets. You can thank Ed McMahon and his dog for that particular comment, because that's where it came from. It was one of the things that they discovered, that it's not just a human thing, it can affect pets. Mold is often undetectable from a visual inspection. As we talked about in those pictures earlier, we see a stain, but we don't know if there's mold. We're, we're going to say there's a stain that should be further evaluated. So unless the mold is visible, okay, and you've got someone, or he or she, or someone who, who is actually trained in it to say it's mold or can test it, the home inspector likely would say it might be some sort of mold. It should be further evaluated. But if he doesn't see or she doesn't see it, it could still be there. That's, that's the trick, right? And that's what your clients need to understand so that they can then educate themselves as best as they can and make a decision that makes them comfortable. Usually, a, a decision made by your client that makes them comfortable will make you comfortable. This is how ours are done. Obviously, our guys walk around and they look for moisture. They look in those areas that commonly contain potential moisture or past moisture. Cabinets, probably one, number one. Right? Attics, underneath the house, roofs. They're looking for moisture, or they're looking for a condition that could lead to moisture intrusion. Here's a great example. Sliding glass door, patio. The threshold, you know what the threshold is? It's, a, it's, a, it's just when you step on to step down on the patio. It's the frame of the door. It's the bottom of the door. That threshold is supposed to be a particular distance above the patio. Because if it's even with the patio, and you're hosing down the patio, cleaning it, or the wind driven rain, Literally, moisture can come right into the house. Now, a mold inspector, an industrial hygienist testing the house with mold, is not going to say anything about that. But that is a potential moisture intrusion area that then the hardwood floors could get wet, and then potentially underneath that rug, mold could begin to grow. So, again, it's a safer bet to look for the moisture. So, we look for the moisture. Then when we find moisture, we find areas that we feel like moisture could be, and in other words, this is underneath the window, we use what's called a moisture meter. And this picture, you can see the moisture meter is all the way to the left, and it's in the green zone. If this wall, this exterior wall in the window, if it did have moisture in it, the meter would read moisture. Now, another way we can find moisture-related issues is with FLIR. This is forward-looking infrared. This is military technology, basically. And what it does is it doesn't tell me there's moisture there, but it tells me the temperature is different. So if I hit a wall with a clear camera, and I'm looking at, at a, a, a blue or a green, it's a cooler color. Color sort of coincides with the temperature. Yellow, hot, red, hot. So I'm looking at that, and if it's an outside wall, let's say next to a window, then I suspect maybe there's a moisture leak, 
then I would go back and I would take my moisture meter in that area and hit it. Now, sometimes it can be blue because there's no insulation. It may be a cold day outside. There's no insulation in the, in the wall, so it's reading a colder temperature. So it doesn't necessarily always mean there's moisture, but it's a tool that we can quickly scan rooms and move through very rapidly looking for those moisture-related issues. Here's an example of how it works. This is a patio sliding glass door. You see how even that is? Don't step down. It should have at least two inches. Okay. So this is what you normally see. This is what it looks like with flare. Moisture is sitting underneath that threshold because the tiles leak and it's under the threshold. Now, as it goes under the threshold, it then gets underneath the hardwood floors or the carpets in the house. Now, that wouldn't have been able to detect, be detected without a flare camera. Here's an attic. Now, in the attic, you can see that we have areas of red, hot, and we have areas of cold. So now it's suspect. Now, this could be a vent that's blowing cold air. It could be a lack of insulation, but we are suspect. So we go downstairs underneath it, and we find this closet, and we shoot the wall. We just discovered a roof leak. We go over there with our moisture meter, we hit it, and it pegs. Now we've got something to discuss. You can see here, there's nothing visible on this wall. Nothing visible at all. So with the tools and the knowledge of a trained moisture inspector, this is what they can potentially come up with, and now we can start creating result resolutions. Mold testing requires samples. Obviously, if we see mold, we're going to recommend sampling it because, again, we don't know what kind of mold it is. The type of mold it is would determine what sort of remediation would need to be done about it, the process of going about removing it. Air samples, we can test them with air samples. We can test them with swab, like that. We can do wall cavity samples, actually in wall. So instead of bashing a hole in the wall, we sometimes we get our tools inside the walls. And then, of course, all those samples go to a lab, an accredited lab, for an analysis. Every sample comes with a chain of custody, by the way. So you never have to worry, like, uh, did that sample actually come from this house? It actually has a chain of custody that's logged in, and it's very, you know, scientific how they do it. And then the lab analyzes it and tells them how many spores and what type of mold, and then a remediation protocol can be uh, generated after that. So what can be done? Household cleaning products. Obviously, keep the house clean. Keep air flowing through the house. You know, if you have open the windows, open a window. Bathrooms. You take a shower in the morning and you rush out the door to go to work, right? You left the shower curtain in an open position, but it's all crumped up and it's wet. Close it. Let it drip. Let air circulate. Keep the ends slightly open. Let air circulate through it. If there's a window and you feel, you know, your security's not at risk, open the window. If there's a fan, leave your fan on for 15 minutes after you shower while you're doing your hair or whatever else your morning routine is. Leave the fan on for a little bit. Remediation, obviously, this mold is inside the wall. This is a significant issue that was found and it needed professional remediation. So this is where you know they would come in and pull off all this material. You can see all the mold on the back of the drywall. The area is contained, so it's not spreading all around the house. And then they take all that effective material out. They clean it with a the biocide. They uh, obviously handle any moisture source, and then they build it all back. <clears throat> and then clearance testing. This is probably the most important thing about remediation. Oftentimes, people will have remediation the mold's removed. They'll have it done, they'll just say, forget about it. Clearance testing is post remediation validation testing. In other words, we need to know that that mold issue actually has been taken care of. How long after it's done? Whenever the remediator says, come back and do the uh, validation testing. So when they have removed their containment and they have you know, said everything's good, then we would come back. Clearance testing, very important after it's done get the area clearance tested so that then there's a certificate that says this mold issue has been handled. Now remember, mold can grow within 24 hours of moisture being introduced. All right. All right.
right? So if we have clearance that doesn't pass, that means mold is still growing and something is missed in that remediation process. So you're going to want to know about that. Your client thinking everything's fine because they've repainted their wall. They could get caught out because in a matter of days or, or weeks, maybe they'll start seeing mold grow on the wall again. So clear system is very, very important. Prevention tips, obviously fix any pipe leaks quickly. Keep your middle low, we just uh, discussed that. Use proper caulking, you know, with this caulking around your sink or your bathtub. Get coughs that don't have those, those uh, natural ingredients, okay? Keep filters clean. We recommend using HEPA filters. Proper drainage. Keep moisture away from the house. Professionally handling any flooding. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't caught out on the last slide. I never know where I am. <laughs> any questions or anything like that, or we handle everything? Awesome. Thanks a lot. Grab yourself a muffin. <laughs>